In ultimate reality, there's only one of us in the room. We're all simply fingers on the hands of God. We look individual, we function individually, but we're not disconnected from the hand itself. Everything is connected to everything else. We're all the same stuff. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Mark Groves Podcast. Today, I am joined by renowned author, Neil Donald Walsh. Welcome. Thank you, Mark. It's lovely to be here with you. How may I serve the moment? Well, I feel like I've been waiting years for this conversation because your book found me, as I'm sure it finds everybody at the apropos time that we require a message or or, um, be invited to trust on a different level. And someone sent me your book because I, so I formerly was, uh, went to school with a Catholic school and my relationship with the word God felt kind of fractured, you know, it felt not clean. I didn't like the word God anymore. I had a hard time relating to spirituality. And it was in my late twenties that I started to come back to that. I was, I was missing an aspect of something. I didn't know what was, but I went on a search and inevitably on that search, a friend of mine said, I, I think you'd really love this book from Neil Donald Walsh. And sure enough, when I picked it up, it was kind of like this renewed conversation or this different way of seeing it that was always there. Yes, it does. It makes perfect sense. And and interestingly enough, Mark, your uh, experience duplicates my own. Except sadly for me, I wasn't in my early 20s or even my early 30s or even my early 40s or even my early 50s, when I chanced upon the information that caught up to you 40 years earlier, in I mean, in your life. So I didn't get to understand what you were finding yourself to be in harmony with. I didn't get to understand that until I was in my late 50s. So, but I do understand the experience that you're describing because I had the exact same experience. You know, in my Catholic, and I don't want to, I'm not a Catholic basher because I think there's great, great wisdom in all the world's great religions, including in the Catholic you know, religion, great, great wisdom and great insight. But I just think, you know, that that most of our world religions are simply incomplete. It's not that they're inaccurate. They're just, they don't have the whole story. So we have to ask ourselves, is it possible, just possible? that there's something more to know on this subject, the knowing of which would change everything. And you know what's funny, Mark? In every other area of human endeavor, we have allowed ourselves to look to see if there's maybe some missing data. In science, we look for you know what data might be missing from what we think we understand, and that's produced incredible, incredible scientific discoveries. In medicine, we look to see, is there something more on this subject that we don't fully understand? And that has led to incredible medical miracles. Even in technology, we look to see, is there something more on this subject that we don't fully understand? And that's put the whole world into our hands, which 25 years ago would have been science fiction. But in the one area, Mark, that is probably the most important single area of our human endeavor, the area of our most sacred beliefs, what some people might call our theology. We have refused to see if there's more to know on this subject. No, 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 Neil, Neil, Neil. It's all all in the book. It's just read the good book. Oh, that's right. Of course, I have to read the book, the Upanishads. No, not the Upanishads. I'm sorry. (laughs) No, 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 the Talmud. No, 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 not the Talmud. The, uh, The Bhagavad Gita. Not the Bhagavad Gita. Well, what then? What? Which one of the 426 books should I be reading? If you don't read the book that tells you about the Catholic Church, and if you don't accept the Catholic idea of who God is and who you are, you're going to hell. Yeah, that doesn't seem like a great alternative. It doesn't matter how nice you are, how kind you are, how forgiving you are, how compassionate you are, how generous you are. It doesn't matter. You didn't come to God through the right doorway, so you're going to be sent to everlasting damnation. Mark, when I was nine years old, I remember the priest coming into our uh, class. He would come in once a week to teach the children catechism. And at the age of nine, I was in the third grade, and he was teaching us about the difference between mortal sin and venial sin. 
And I recall him saying, you know, that mortal sin was a sin that was not forgiven by God. I mean, if, if we confessed it and went to confession and we received absolution, okay, fair enough. But if, if we died with a mortal sin on your soul, you will go directly to hell. So, of course, I raised my nine-year-old hand, Mark, and I asked the priest, oh, Father, can you give me an example of a mortal sin? I mean, because I'm, I'm nine years old. I'm thinking, well, he's, he's got to be talking about murder, you know, or rape of a child or something really horrible, stealing someone's life savings. He says, yeah, I can tell you what a mortal sin is. Missing Mass on Sunday. Mm. I said, F -f 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 Father, uh, are you telling me that if I miss Mass one week of my life, and I happen to get hit by a car on Monday before I go to confession to confess my incredible sin, that God will send me to hell for the rest of eternity for missing Mass? I thought he got, he's got to be kidding or, yeah. or, or making some kind of a statement you know, for emphasis. No, he said, no, no, that, that's a mortal sin. You must attend Mass. And I thought, even at the age of nine, let me see if I've got this right. God is filling the pews using fear as the device, as the tool. And then as I grew older, I, I came to realize that many people in the world consider it to be a virtue, to be a, quote-unquote, God-fearing man. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to fear God. And we're supposed to do what God wants us to do and demands us to do out of fear. So uh, I realized then, you know, there's there's something wrong here. There's something missing. But this This can't be the way it really is. This can't be, if there is a God at all, why would God behave like some tyrant who's intolerable, who will judge us, condemn us, and punish us for something as, excuse me, trivial as missing church one week of your life? Mm -hmm. You know, it was really funny, just to round out that story, that would be the one week, because I was an altar boy. So I was actually, <laughs> I was actually, you know, uh, attending church every single, not just uh, every Sunday, but every morning, because they'd had Mass every morning in our parish, and I was an altar boy. So I was serving at Mass wow. almost every morning of my life. I hardly ever missed church. But this particular Sunday, at, it happened to be the playground World Series, so to speak, you know, the, <laughs> the, between the two playgrounds in, in the city I was, you know, in, in which I was a child, and which was Milwaukee. I went to the ball game because the kids were saying, "Dad, you got to be on the uh, you got to be on the team. You got to be there. You're our right fielder." I mean, the worst place to be on a baseball team, but at least I got on the team. So. I played right field. Yeah, I know it. But so I went to the game and I missed mass as it happened that week. Now, <laughs> After the, now you got the priest is telling me the next uh, on Wednesday of that week that if I don't get the confession in a hurry, if I were hit by a car on Thursday or Friday because we had confessions only one day a week in my parish on Saturday afternoons, we, you know, I'm going to go right straight to hell. If you don't think that's going to send a nine-year-old home a bit nervous, looking both ways at every corner. Oh, man, I bet. Yeah, you know, making sure that nothing hits me, that a piano doesn't fall out of somebody's second-story window and kill me. You know, I'm just looking everywhere to make sure I can get to confession by Saturday. And every night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, and Friday night, I'm saying my prayers. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Please, God, please, let me just, I didn't mean to miss Mass. I'll never miss Mass again for the rest of my life. Making these promises out of utter fear. Now, of course, I've missed Mass for about 50 years. So I guess. Straight to hell. Oh, I, I, there's no question about it. But as George Bernard Shaw said a few years ago, all the interesting people are there anyway. <laughs> that's such a great line i remember reading in uh one of your books i think it's the god solution where you talk about pure love being yes yes the the essence of god i really like that because i related to also what you referred to as the god dilemma in that you know you're saying there's you know if i don't read all 426 books it's like one thing that we just don't seem to agree upon. But yet when you declare it as being pure love, and then I know you go through this series of questions of being like, you know, is this pure love? Like if we were to ask ourselves our behaviors in the context of pure love, you know, I think like, would God want you at mass that you feel afraid to go to or at the World Series of your neighborhood? I mean, I'd say the World Series of the Neighborhood. That feels like no doubt to me that joy is in a boy's heart while he's playing in an afternoon. And 
what you said about us not being willing to be curious about it. What do you think is the resistance that humans have to the curiosity, to opening, to asking questions about God? Because I know in my experience that was, well, it's just faith. Like, well, I'm like, well, wait. So that means you can't be curious or ask questions or challenge anything. I was very much like you. I would ask questions in religion class and not be met with answers that really satisfied <laughs> my mind because they didn't make logical sense. You know, so I'm curious why you think we're resistant to curiosity. Well, because our culture trains us to, to not be curious. Our whole cultural story says, no, you are to accept basically without question what you've been told, not just about God, but about, you know, politics or what you've been told about life in, in general, you know, the purpose of life, who you are, all, all that you've been told by your culture by your tribes, by your family at home, by your religions, yes, by your philosophies, you know, all, um, by your media, um, all the input you've received, you are to not question it. In fact, there are some countries, even today, and I'm, make, I'm not making this up, there are some countries, even on this day, that if you question uh, theology, theological statements, you're considered an apostate a blasphemer, a heretic, and you can be tried on ecclesiastical sins and condemned to hell. So why why are we reluctant to be curious? <laughs> we've been taught. <laughs> That's a good reason. We, we, well, we've been taught not to be curious. And we, we now have even world leaders, people who have been, you know, presidents or, or emperors or prime ministers of countries who have been daring the people, the populace, to question anything they say. And anything that they say that's been questioned is ridiculed. And then they use insults. We have a particular individual in the United States who um, loves to use in insults, literally, brutally, verbally bashes everyone who disagrees with him with the cruelest kinds of personal insults. Not, I have a political disagreement. Not I have a political contrast, a particular personal insult. The other person has no integrity, has no intelligence, has, has no ability to see, see things correctly. And, and we have now decided that verbal bashing is a form of leadership. That's where we've come, and not just in the United States, but in many places around the world. And if verbal bashing doesn't work, We'll send in troops and kill thousands of people and see if that works. We've had armed conflict in all but 2% of recorded history, Mark. That's the kind of civilization that we live in. Currently, on this day, on this very day of our life, over 650 children on this planet will die of starvation every hour. Every hour. We haven't been civilized enough to figure out a way to get food to 650 starving children who die every hour of insufficient nutrition. We call ourselves an advanced species. Clearly, there's something we don't fully understand here about who we are, the purpose of life, the nature of ultimate reality, and the highest power. The understanding of which would change everything. And so that's what I've devoted my life to. I know I'm, you know, spitting into the wind, hoping to get some kind of a different outcome, but doing my best with the 40 books I've written, including my latest book, which is titled God Talk. Yeah, your book, God Talk, I what I loved about it is the context of actual people's stories. Isn't that great? Well, it becomes relatable. The publisher was very, very clever. Uh, you know, that's not a book that I wrote, and then I'm seeking a publisher. Actually, I was called by the publishing company, that, which is very rare. They usually don't call authors. Authors that's a nice usually, gift. Way yeah. to go, God. Uh, yeah, re really. Authors are usually calling publishers or at least getting their agents to see if they can get their book published. But in this case, one day my phone rings, and it's the publishing company. Got my number from my literary agent. Called me at home. Would you be willing to write a book for us? And in answer to the question that, that people have been asking since your first book, 
conversations with God came out, which is, how can we have our own conversation with God? I said, you know what? I'd be delighted to write that book. So I did. And then they very cleverly included the stories of other people who've also experienced the entry of divine wisdom, a direct communication from God uh, in their life. And those stories are fascinating. So between those stories and what I have to offer of my own experience, the book hopefully brings people, the average person, uh, an opportunity to experience their own communication with the divine. It's my understanding, of course, that we're all having conversations with God all the time. We're simply calling them something else. <laughs> but we don't want to be ridiculed. We don't want to be marginalized. So we call it, you know, women's intuition or a sudden insight or an epiphany or, you know, a brilliant idea or, you know, whatever we can get away with. Because if we actually say, you know, God told me this, we're going to be ridiculed. Oh, Neil, Neil, really? So we don't call it that. But I have decided to name it exactly what it is. I believe it's a communication from the source of divine wisdom that resides within every sentient being in the cosmos. I could, of course, be wrong about all of that, but I don't think so. <laughs> well, I think everyone can relate to some sort of crazy serendipitous thing or like a happenstance or like a idea hits them or whatever it is. And as you said, we call it something different. I'm curious for people listening who might be wondering, can they talk with God? And is God, you know, hanging out, listening to them? I hope that I just answered that question 10 seconds ago. When I said that God is talking, that God is talking to everybody all the time. People are simply calling it something else. They, they do call it women's intuition or an epiphany or whatever words they can come up with. When, when an idea hits them out of the blue and uh, they get information that really helps them. You're driving down the road and you turn turn the corner and they're on the billboard, on the billboard on the highway, is a message that speaks directly to what you were thinking about or you've been pondering some real life challenge. But the next day you go to the beauty salon or to the hair hairstylist and they're on the, uh, on the table while you're in the waiting room waiting for the for the hairstylist, a bunch of old magazines, the cover story of which, on one of them, directly addresses what you have been asking about for three months. And there it is. Those kinds of things happen to people all the time. And uh, so, as I said, we call it something else. Coincidence, serendipity. I call it conversations with God. How do people begin to open themselves up to that? Well, first first of all, we have to realize that there is a God, that there is a, a, a higher power in the universe. Then they have to see that they are, uh, that God is talking to all of us all the time, which by the way, is, is not an unusual uh, uh, idea for human beings to embrace. Many, many billions of people already embrace the idea. Yeah, God does talk to humanity. I mean, God has talked to human beings. You know, he spoke to Moses. He spoke to Jesus. He spoke to Muhammad, bless his holy name. He spoke to Buddha. He spoke to, and even, believe it or not, even spoke to women. I know it's hard to believe because women are second-class citizens in God's world. But he actually even spoke to women. He inspired Joan of Arc. He inspired Catherine of Genoa. He inspired Julian of Norwich. He inspired Mother Mary. He inspired Mary, many, many women as well. So we we have accepted that God speaks directly to human beings. So step three, then, step one, embrace the fact that God exists. Step two, embrace the fact that God talks to human beings. But step three, important one, embrace the fact that we individually are among the worthy to be receiving information from God. You don't have to be the Pope. You don't have to be, you know, the chief ulama or the, or the head rabbi. You don't have to be a walking saint. You can even be a slob like me, that God will talk to all of us. Somebody wrote a song about this a few, a few years ago. What if God was, you know, talking to all of us? You know, even to me, a slob on the bus. But God is talking uh, to all of us. So then step number four is to be open to receiving 
the uh, communication. And and step five is not to deny it when you do receive it, not to call it. Ah, it was just a coincidence, you know, or to. Or, I don't like and, that answer. <laughs> or, or yeah, or, yeah, or it's too good to be true. Sometimes it's too good to be true. Uh, I, I, I I remember saying that to God in my communications with the divine. Um, she said something to me that was really really wonderful, and I said, you know what, this is almost too good to be true. God's reply, Neil. If God can't be too good to be true. Who can? God's got a sense of humor. Yeah. Step number six is to step into the response, the active response. That, in other words, do something about it. Do something about the message that you've received. Don't allow yourself to just you know, go through the first five steps. Receive the information from the divine that serves you in this exact moment, and then do nothing about it, but in fact respond to it and do something about what you've been allowed to realize. Sometimes it comes in um, very quick and spontaneous ways. I was driving home from a party a few years ago, many years ago now that I think about it, but you know, 30 or 40 years ago, driving home from a party, it was 2.30 in the morning, and I came up on a, a, to a stop sign, I stopped, of course, at the stop sign, but there was nobody there. It was totally deserted. It's 2.30 in the morning. So I stopped at the stop sign momentarily, stepped on the gas pedal to go through the intersection. But I heard a voice in my head, in my head at that point that just said, stop. And there's nobody around. I don't know who, who was saying that. But with the impulse, I heard the word stop yelled at me in my head. And of course, I hit the brakes immediately. Not a moment too soon, because at that exact second, some looked like a teenager from what I could see, whizzed by the intersection left to right in front of me, had to be going at least 75 or 80 miles an hour, you know, in a 25 mile an hour zone. Just, you know, 2.30 in the morning, thinking there's nobody there, zipping right through the intersection, some young kid. But if I had not stopped for no apparent reason, when I first looked, there was nobody there. That's how fast he was going, by the way. When I first looked left and right, there was nobody there. Yeah. And, and you know, moments, seconds later, there he was. But if I hadn't hit the brakes, I wouldn't be here to tell you this story. But I have learned to pay attention. And that's how all of us can have the experience of our own conversations with God. Pay attention. Don't ridicule it. Don't dismiss it. And act on it. This episode was brought to you by The Wellness Company. Now, you guys know I'm all about standing in the truth of what matters to me. And when it comes to my health and my family's health, I am very careful who I take advice from. Trust and transparency are so important to me, especially now that I'm a new dad. Now, the wellness company was formed by a team of doctors who lost their jobs and they were subsequently canceled, censored, for speaking up and pushing back against the mismanagement of the pandemic. As a native Canadian and former pharmaceutical rep, I am all too familiar with the failings of the current system and it is pretty clear that we need some sort of massive change. Now, not only does the wellness company offer live telemedicine services, but they also have a wide range of high quality doctor formulated supplements that are designed to one, degrade the spike protein and protect you from shedding, boost your immune system, support your heart health, help you sleep better, and there's so many more. They recently just launched the Spike Support Formula. Now, it's the only product I've seen that contains a unique combination of natural ingredients, including natokinase and dandelion root extract. Natokinase has been shown to help break down and eliminate the spike protein, and dandelion root blocks it from binding to your cells. To support those experiencing side effects from the shots and to help those suffering from long COVID and to protect you from shedding, the Spike Support is one supplement that everyone can benefit from in this post-pandemic world. The truth is that we all need to be taking steps to protect ourselves from that toxic spike protein. Get yourself the wellness company's spike support formula now. You can go to twc.health slash groves and use the code groves at checkout to save 15% off. So that's twc.health slash groves to save 15%. Where do you think the greatest resistance that we have lies after we accept that the, step one? Believing that we're worthy. I mean, I think about that. I was thinking about that before our conversation. That, Well, in your case, I can understand how you would think it because you are not worthy, but most of us are. <laughs> well, that nailed it. But yeah, I wonder that. I was like, what makes someone have the channel? Well, that's a different question. Let me, let me address the question of worthiness. As I said a minute ago, 
our world has told us in a hundred different ways since we were two years old that we're not worthy. One way or another, we've been told that we're not enough. We're not getting it right. You know, and hopefully by the time we're in our middle adult years, we feel a, at least a little bit good about ourselves. But there's always still that thought, am I, am I worthy to be spoken to? I mean, directly by God? You know, because we because we're aware of all the quote unquote mistakes we've made, all the things we've done that weren't okay, and all the rest. So our culture has is a culture that had teaches us unworthiness. Now, what to answer your last question? What opens the channel? I think it doesn't have to be necessarily desperation, but desperation certainly helps. <laughs> it helped me. I was in a desperate place, and I just finally called out to God. Okay. What does it take to make life work? What is it that I don't understand here? Tell me the rules. I'll play. I'll play the game. Just tell me the rules. And after you give me the rules, don't change them. <laughs> yeah, so, because I, my other my other experience is that the rules were changing every every time I turned around. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but what what opens the channel? I think, uh, but it doesn't have to be desperation. I think what opens the channel is simply willingness. Willingness to agree that there is a God and that we are all, all implanted with an aspect of divinity that resides within every one of us. It isn't as if God is coming to us in any particular moment. It's my understanding that God, divinity, if you please, resides within every sentient being in the cosmos from birth to death. And of course, after death as well. That's not even a theological statement. I mean, exclusively theological. Scientists have, are coming to the same conclusion. Einstein, Albert Einstein said 40 years ago, the biggest mistake we're making is thinking that there's this experience of separation, that nothing is separate from anything else. Everything is simply one element, if you please, one energetic, simply expressing in different forms. And scientists are reaffirming what Einstein was telling us almost a half century ago. So there's nothing new here. It's the only thing that might be new would be whether a particular individual is willing, ready, and able to embrace the reality of what we're saying here. That coming back to unity, that coming back to feeling connected to other people, connected to the earth when i was a kid i remember stepping on an ant you know like stepping on a bunch of ants killing them as they were walking across the sidewalk not really connected to the experience and now i have a hard time killing any bug or any animal mosquitoes they're a little tough they're the only one that i have a hard time making a negotiation over but it, there's a that coming back to unity piece the responsibility that comes with that recognition like what you're saying with that god is within us that we're connected all beings are connected i 100 percent agree and if we accept that as true which makes us have the ability to be with god be with the, the conversation is coming through us as opposed to to us but also then we have this responsibility to everything we're connected to because now we're talking like well to harm me is to harm you to harm you is to harm me right like so the level of responsibility that this requires sounds like it's, I mean, I agree with it and I'm I'm fully on board, but I think for a lot of people, that's like their lives have to change in a significant way. The whole world would change in a significant way, Mark, if we simply accepted what every spiritual master of every one of the world's religions has been telling us for centuries. This is not new age information. This is not like, wow, I never thought about that. We've been told this by the spiritual masters that we honor in every one of the world's philosophies and religions for hundreds and hundreds of years. One guy said it quite simply, love your neighbor as yourself. Yes, but it, but it is, I love the word you used, it's an enormous responsibility. It's a response ability. Hmm. The ability to respond, totally understand is true. That what I do for you, I do for me. And then what I fail to do for you, I fail to do for me. Because in ultimate reality, 
there's only one of us in the room. We're all simply fingers on the hands of God. We look individual, we function individually, we appear to be individually functioning, and we are in fact, but we're not disconnected from the hand itself. So we're all fingers on the hands of God. Individualized for sure, but separated at no level at all. Everything is connected to everything else. We're all the same stuff. Carl Sagan came up with that idea about 25 or 30 years ago. He, you know, he, he the wonderful astronomer and, and scientist, Carl Sagan said, you know what? We're analyzing now a few rocks that we brought back, our spaceships have brought back some rocks from outer space. Guess what? The same chemical construction of everything on Earth, including you and me, simply in different formats, in different variation. So I was told in Conversations with God, chapter one of 3,000 pages across nine books, I was told in chapter one of book one, all things are one thing. There is only one thing, and all things are part of the one thing there is. So does it feel like a heavy responsibility? It does until it doesn't anymore, until it starts to feel like really a joyous ability to respond, a joyous response ability. And so now, these days, I just love the hell out of going down the street. I mean, I literally love the hell out of it. I love the hell out of going down the street and just noticing that we're all one. And that everyone is just another version of me. And I even interact with people in that way. Saying to others what I know will brighten their day. I'm not bragging. I'm, I'm trying not to pat myself on the back too hard here. But I'm just wanting to give an example of how this can change a person's life. And how it changed my life is I was invited by God, Neil. Here are some missions you may wish to undertake. Well, number one, change the world's mind about God. Number two, give people back to themselves. Mm. Because people have forgotten who they really are. And what if you decided to be just a messenger, just someone who chooses to give people back to themselves in whatever way the moment provides? And to give you a, just a, a simple example, a couple of years ago, I was coming out of a coffee shop and a policeman was putting a parking ticket on my car. Apparently, I had the parking meter had run out and I had overstayed my time on the parking meter. So he was you know, doing his job and putting a parking ticket on my car. And I walked up to him and I said, sir, could I talk to you a minute? And I knew he thought I was going to give him a ration for ticketing my car. He said, yeah. I said, I just want you to know something about what I'm feeling right now. He said, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I said, you know, it's not lost on me that when you leave your house in the morning, and just before walking out the door, you put that little piece of silver metal and pin it to your chest. That you're making a silent promise that if something should come between me and harm's way, you would stand between us, even if it cost you your life. And I want you to know that's not lost on me. And I appreciate you for what you've chosen to do. You've chosen to make a life, not just a living. He looked at me and he... Pulled the ticket off from under the windshield wiper, started to tear it up. I said, no, 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 we're not doing that. This is not quid pro quo. This was not tit for tat. This was not you know, idle plottery to get you to tear up my ticket. Please put that ticket right back on my car. You were doing your job. I meant what I said. And this guy walked up to me. He was, uh, that wasn't a young man. He was about 57. He walked up to me. He wasn't crying. But there was a little bit of water you could see just welling up in his eye. And he said, you know what, mister? 
I've been on this force for 27 years. No one has ever, ever said something like that to me. You've just made my whole career. Every day we have an opportunity to give people back to themselves. Not even by lying or idle flattery, by just simply telling the truth. By seeing people. That's who they really are. You know, there was a wonderful motion picture out a few years ago called Avatar. And it was a great love story. But what's interesting in that movie, if you watch it again, you might notice, maybe you didn't notice it the first time around, but in that movie, even though it was a story of love, nobody, at no point in the entire film were the words, I love you, ever spoken. Mm. It was not part of the dialogue between any of the characters. What did the main characters say to each other who were in love with each other? I see you. Mark, to be seen and to see others. That's who they really are. You go through one day doing that. One day. Be careful. It'll change your life. I'm at the post office. Can I take a package to get mailed? There's a line there. A couple of clerks at the counter. Finally, the guy calls me for his next. Calls me forward. And as I'm giving him my big package to mail off, I said, I'm, I'm glad I got to be in your line today. He said, yeah, why? I said, you know what? You're efficient. You're effective. You also have a great sense of humor. I've been here before. I've seen you interact with people. You really know what you're doing, and you do it so well. And I'm just really glad I got your line. He looked up at me, and he said, well, that's a nice thing to say. Thanks a lot. If you simply tell everyone you encounter in the next 30 days, I see you. You can't hide from me. I see who you are. And tell them what you see. It'll change your life. And it becomes addictive. You'll never stop doing it. You start looking for things to see in people, to tell them about, that can give them back to themselves. You know, because we all want to think that what we thought about ourselves when we were seven is true. When I was seven years old, I thought I was a really nifty guy. I thought I was talented and wonderful, smart, you know, clever and fun and good. I thought all those things about me when I was seven. Then the world proceeded to drag those ideas out of me and convince me that I was wrong about myself when I was seven. And so now I've rediscovered my seven-year-old. We were all as wonderful as we knew ourselves to be when we were seven. That sentence really touched something for me. And uh, my experience of having gone through things in my late 20s, gone on the search to figure out who I am. I'm now 44. It's amazing that the essence of who I was as a kid, you're right, is who I now know myself to be. The curiosity, the sensitivity, the joy, the play, all those things that society, some of them I was told were not okay, like sensitivity, things like that. You know, but as I came back to them, I realized that I was, you know, in some way restoring what is whole within myself and like welcoming back these gifts, these things that, you know, were given or I was born with that I was given. And that idea of giving people back to themselves. I remember a friend of mine telling me that in every interaction, this specifically she was talking about with customer service people, she was saying, see them as if they're God. Like you're going to get a message from God through these people. And so uh, I, I tried it at the ultimate place. I went to the airport. And I feel like that's one of the greatest testing grounds for patience, all the things. And I was like, I'm going to do this. But I like walked up to the clerk at Delta. And I remember thinking like, I'm talking to God. And when I had to change a flight and when I went up, she was like, well, are you flying first class? And I was like, no, I'm not. And she was like, do you want to? I was like, well, yeah, I do. And so she just upgraded my flights. I had two legs to catch. And I got out of there and I said to my friend, like, I wish I'd discovered this advice years ago because my experience interacting with people 
has been completely upgraded in that if they're in a bad mood, but you approach them as if they're God, because they are, as you know, as we were talking about, <laughs> they can't be left, you know, not uplifted in some way, you know, because who speaks to people, especially in customer service positions with that? Not generally a lot of people, not to say some people don't, but that invitation is really beautiful. I also want to cut that line you used on the guy who was doing the parking ticket. I mean, that is profound. What's interesting is that inevitably when I talk this way in front of a, a, a live audience, somebody stands up in the back of the room and says, oh, no, 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 no. You're going to try to tell me that you're God. And I say, whoa, 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 wait, wait a minute, I didn't say that I'm God. Yes, you did, I heard you. I said, no, no, I said, I'm an individuation of divinity. Mm. Is a wave the ocean? Or is a wave simply an arising of the ocean? Not separate from the ocean, not something other than the ocean, but an arising of the ocean in powerful, glorious, spectacular, individual form. And when that individual expression is complete, the wave recedes back into the ocean, whence it came. So is it in our relationship with the divine. So I'm not saying that I'm the sum total of God. I'm saying that I'm an individuation of divinity, as is every sentient being in the cosmos. Indeed, everything in the universe, every tree, every blade of grass, every flower, Yes, every mosquito. I know that one's tough, though. I just blow them. I just <laughs> I give them a warning. Yeah, give them a warning. I call it the mosquito warning. I'm curious: is there any specific story from the book that you? I mean, I'm sure you love all of them. Is there a specific one that you could share? You mean from the story, the, from the book, God from God Talk? Talk? Yeah. One was it was fascinating. Uh, a a four year old child. In, uh, gave his mother some advice on what she could do in a difficult situation. And he just said, I, I need to get into the story because it's a pr personal, private story. But he just said, Mom, Mommy, why don't you, you know, and then he said what he said. And she thought about it for a couple of minutes. She, she thought, wow, I probably should do that. And it turned out to be the best advice she had gotten from all the people she talked to about her particular problem. And she realizes that the divine was speaking to her through her four-year-old son. Wow. It's my awareness that that which is divine resides within all of us. That's how seven-year-old children can sit down and play Mozart without making an error. Or a nine-year-old child in, in uh, Illinois winds up painting like Rembrandt. And we wonder, what's going on here? What, what's that about? Prior lifetime? Probably so. The wisdom of divinity within you? Probably so. Or a combination of all of the above. The point being, Mark, there's more going on here than meets the eye. This journey through life is a great deal more than most people imagine that it is. Or as Bill said a few years ago, he didn't say it out loud, but he wrote it into one of his plays. Bill wrote, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, that are dreamt of in your philosophy. Ah, yes. So it is. So the question was and becomes to this day, to be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to rise up against his sea of troubles and by opposing to end them, to die, to sleep, to sleep, perchance to dream. Aye, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come. It's really quite simple. I could, of course, be wrong about all of this. I think you're onto something and you're making something that we have often had resistance to or wounding with, you know, like your story, like my story. And to be able to come back to it in the way that you've invited through all your writing. I'm, I mean, this is your 40th book, which congratulations. Like that's, my wife and I just wrote our first book. So 40, one was pretty challenging to write. And you wrote 40. 
So I'm just like in awe, like what well, way to go. I'm curious what makes God Talk special or different from the you know previous books that you've written? Well, I don't know that it's special in the sense of being better than or more than the other books. I wouldn't I wouldn't make that claim for it. That would be inaccurate. Different? Yeah. I think it's different because every book would be different or I'd be writing the same thing over and over again. What makes it different is that it includes um, details behind the six-step process by which people can experience their own conversation with God. It also offers, at the end of the book, a wonderful challenge for us to begin to start talking, not only with God, but about God. I issue a direct challenge to readers. Why don't we talk more about God in our life? Whoever told us that you know, you're not supposed to talk about religion or politics in polite company. Who said that? Who made up that rule? Why don't we talk more about this idea of, of the highest power around the water cooler at work or at home or at a dinner party or at a cocktail party or wherever we happen to be, you know, where conversation is taking place? Why don't we have conversations about God and then just, just bring up the topic? What do you think about God? Do you think there really is a God? Do you think that if God is an energy, just an energetic force, do you think that energy can be used by human beings in day-to-day -day life in any particular way? You know, it, it might just be that you brought up a topic that someone else has been, I want to say, I almost want to say dying to talk about. <laughs> that someone else has been dying to talk about and just nobody ever brings it up because we're told that we're not supposed to talk about it unless you're you know, in synagogue or in church or in a Muslim in a mosque someplace. So other than that, you can't talk about it. That's what makes the book different. When I think when, I, I love that challenge because I, when you speak about the talking about God, the one thing I think that comes up in my experience is that previously when I've had people around me talk about God is it's their God they're talking about that I have to agree with or assimilate to their conversation. And I think the way that you created those questions like, what do you think God is? Do you think it's an, it doesn't in any way say this is what God is. It's saying, let's participate in a conversation about something that, you know, I think resonates within all of us. This, this desire to be connected to something greater, this desire to recognize the connection to something greater. I think of um, the quote from Jonathan Haidt, who is an atheist, you know, so to speak, but he, he says that everyone has a God-sized hole within them. And the idea being that we all have a desire to search for the divine. He thinks that the intention is from a survival-based perspective. But I think about it from the perspective of what connects us. I mean, that's the, that feels like the answer to everything is if all of a sudden we recognize the divinity in one another, we're not going to want to harm one another. We're going to want to feed one another. We're going to want to take care of one another. We're going to want to take care of this planet and all sentient beings on it would be a nice world if we did that, and all it would take would be for us to simply grow up spiritually. Right now we're acting like two-year-olds. But if we can get to a place of maturing, or as we say in the spiritual realm, evolving, if we can simply move our evolutionary process forward, we can make the world a far better place. But guess what? Time is running out. It's now or never time. It is. I feel that very much so. First off, thanks so much for making the time and taking the time to come on the podcast and speak with me. I feel like uh, going from audio books from you and the written book is where I started to being able to have a conversation with you on my podcast and share it with other people in, in the belief that it will find people where the, you know they need to be found, that the words that you've shared today will resonate with people on their journey to open up a conversation with God, that we are all having it and it's happening all the time. We just call it something different. So just with such immense gratitude to what you've dedicated your life to and you know your work has helped guide and usher me so that I'm really grateful. So thanks for taking the time. You're very generous with those words, uh, Mark. It's very sweet of you, and I receive receive that energy with humility, humility and gratitude. Thank you. I'm glad I had a chance to share this time with you. For the people listening, where can they find your book? Where can they find more about you? And we'll put the links all in the show notes. 
they can find they can find the book at virtually uh, any online bookstore, and um, they can learn more about me by just going to CWG, which stands for, of course, Conversations of the God. So if they want to stay connected with that energy, just go to CWGConnect.com. There I am. Perfect. Any final words? I asked God, what is the most important thing you want me to understand about all of this? And she said, Neil, it's really very simple. You think your life is about you. And your life has nothing to do with you. It's about everyone whose life you touch and the way in which you touch it. it changed my whole life. And then I realized, in the largest sense, life is about me. Because the way I touch other people touches me because there's only one of us in the room. Neil Donald Walsh, thanks so much. Thank you, my friend.